What's up y'all, it's Shuffle, and today's video is going to be the follow-up to the one common mistake video that I made the other day, and this one is one tip for each hero. As always, before we get started, if you enjoyed the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up, leave your thoughts down below, and then check out the description box for all the cool stuff like Discord, Twitter, Twitch, and Patreon. Lots of fun stuff to behold for yourself, so give it a look if you haven't already. We also have to give a shout out to Thick Baney Sausage, who helped me put this video together. I ran the ideas past him, and then he had his own input on the tips that we were going to offer, so shoutouts where shoutouts are due. Of course, if you've not checked out Thick, you should do that as well. We'll start the alphabetical way this time, and the first tip with Abomination is to just leave him in human mode as long as possible. The reason is he does pretty well in his human mode normally, and then you should be treating Transform as an on-demand damage button. It gives A-Bomb a bit of healing, and then also gives him a ton of damage on top of it, so if you find yourself in a position where you have to do a lot of damage quickly, that's when you hit Transform. It's pretty hard to build a team around transforming normally, and usually it is not advised. For Antiquarian, make sure you don't sleep on Flash Powder. Flash Powder is a very good move. It is fantastic at shutting down a single huge threat, such as a large enemy or some kind of high damage dealer. So all you have to do is hit them with Flash Powder once or twice, and then your team is pretty safe for the most part. They have a pretty good chance of missing you. And that alone is good enough contribution to the fight from Antiquarian side, who usually doesn't have good combat prowess. For Arbalest, it's kind of a combo tip, so the first part of it is don't sleep on Suppressing Fire, and the second one is to know when to shoot instead of using Suppressing Fire. Many enemies are very squishy in the backline, so you don't have to mark them to take them down, you can just shoot them once and have someone else hit them, or shoot them twice if you really need to. And then also there are enemies that you can push to the back, like size 2s, or just some enemies that aren't Cultist Witch. You know, for instance, the Spitting Pig in the Warrens, that thing is pretty annoying and it can hit you with a disease. It has a pretty solid crit rate as well. Or sometimes the Hook Pigs also find their way to the back of the party. So Suppressing Fire is really good in those situations, because the crit debuff from it is so big that most enemies cannot crit you once it's applied, and the accuracy drop is also pretty good. The tip for Bounty Hunter is a team building type of tip, and that is do not be afraid to put him in rank 3. That's the backline of your party. This gets even better if you can run a second character with a stun like Houndmaster in front of Bounty Hunter, even though your first instinct is likely to put Bounty Hunter in 2 and Houndmaster in 3. These two already have a lot of synergy, but the thing that Thick said that made a lot of sense is don't mistake Bounty Hunter having two stuns as being as strong as someone or a team that has two stunners. So having Houndmaster in 2 gives him Blackjack, and then having Bounty Hunter in 3 gives you Flashbang. That is a lot more control, especially when paired up with a combo like Plague Doctor and Flagellant. This way you can have the entire enemy team locked down and taking a bunch of damage over time, for instance. My Crusader tip is make sure to take advantage of the fact that Crusader can heal from anywhere. He can heal both HP and stress damage. It's not as strong at Apprentice level, but once he gets to Veteran and Champion stuff and he gets his Trinkets, he gets very good at doing this. And it's a nice answer to people who think they need to take Jester and Vestal to every single team, because Crusader can do both. He can also do it from everywhere, which the aforementioned two characters cannot. They are locked into the backline in order to heal. The tip for Flagellant is that he is one of the best heroes to skill swap on mid-dungeon. He's a character where you may not need Endure or Suffer for the first three fights, but the three fights right before you camp, when everyone's taking a bit of extra damage, and one person may be up to like 60 stress, he's really good at evening that out, especially because he can camp and heal a bunch of his stress with one skill. My tip for Grave Robber is probably one most of you have heard before, because I say it pretty constantly in my streams and some other videos, but you do not need a full dance team to use Grave Robber. You can run her as a dedicated range build if you really wanted to, but if you also want to run Lunge, which I would suggest, all you need is a team that can function in position A and position B. So that means that your middle two people, once they get pushed behind her from lunge, they can still do everything they want, and at the same time they should be able to do everything they want before she lunges when they're in the middle ranks. This is personally why I feel Abomination is Grave Robber's best partner, because he can still blight and stun from both rank 2 and rank 3. For Hellion, the most efficient way to do her damage is to start from the back of the enemy party and work your way up to the front. So I usually advise starting with Iron Swan, and then if it bleeds on rank 4 and 3, and then afterwards either if it bleeds on rank 2 or start hitting bleed out depending on the enemies remaining. The reason for this is even though bleed out is very strong in terms of its damage output, it does lower her damage on her other skills as well. So if you're using bleed out on turn 1 or spamming yop or using breakthrough, Hellion is going to gas out before the backline is dead and the backline is the one doing the lasting damage via stress. However, this doesn't mean that opening with yop is always a bad thing. It's a bit of a nuanced thing so I guess wait for the Hellion guide to talk about that further. My Highwayman tip is that as good as Repose can be, don't sleep on Pistol Shot. So you should be starting Highwayman in the back of your party, so either rank 4 or 3. This way he gets an extra duelist advance over the course of the fight, so his Repose stays up 
for longer. Most fights are over by turn four. You probably heard me say that before. So having Highwayman have her post up for pretty much the entire time is pretty nice. However, the other half of that is that it leaves them open to use Pistol Shot, which is a great way to clean up backline enemies with someone that has some pretty decent damage. You also shouldn't be sleeping on Gunslinger Buckle because it boosts that same Pistol Shot that we were just talking about. For Houndmaster, consider starting him in rank 2 because of Blackjack. He is a bit squishy, but he has access to a lot of dodge, either through Guard and Trinkets, and Blackjack is a very good stun. So much so that rank 2 is probably his strongest spot on the team. If you find yourself needing Cry Havoc at some point during the expedition, then feel free to move him back to rank 2 and put whoever's in the back in front of him because your team probably still operates that way. Another solution is to have someone behind him like Highwayman who can use Duelist Advance or Man in Arms who can use Rampart to move past him for no tempo loss at all. With Jester, you probably want to use Finale at some point just because it's a cool move that does a bunch of damage and it's really fun and it's a good button to press, but you may find yourself having trouble with the timing. The easiest rule of thumb for finale pacing that I can give you is if you're not in a boss battle, so if it's a regular hallway fight or room fight, you can probably drop finale on turn 3 or 4 and that's the best time for it. If you're in a boss battle, since the buffs to finale last so long on Jester's moves, you can drop it on turn 8 and that's probably the end of the fight. For Leper, don't sleep on Intimidate. This move covers a lot of options, such as lowering enemy damage, but it also de-stealths enemies, marks Leper, and then alters the speed as well. Leper himself gets a speed boost for using it, and the enemy, if the debuff sticks, loses speed. Because of this, it's probably the best anti-stealth move in the game, because the main issue with de-stealthing enemies is they're usually faster or fast enough that when you de-stealth them, it doesn't really matter because you're not going to get to hit them. But if you're able to lower their speed with Intimidate, then you can actually bully them on turn 2, which is something other stealth moves can't do. With Man in Arms, Bellow is a great opening skill. The speed debuff from the ability means that your team is most likely going first across the board on turn 2. By being able to go first on turn 2, you have much more control of the fight, so you can pick which targets to take down, which other ones to stun, and other things that you may need to be doing, such as healing. It does have to make two checks to stick to enemies, but universally debuff resist on enemies is usually one of the lower ones that they have. It's also helpful to use in the early game because lacking accuracy trinkets and unupgraded skills is something everyone struggles with. The tip for Cultist is to remember that he can fit into a lot of teams pretty easily. When you're making a team with a Cultist in it, you have to decide what you want him to do and then build your team according to that. Do you want him to stun? Do you want him to do a bunch of debuffs? Do you want him to kill Eldritch enemies? All these are questions you need to ask yourself when you're picking a cultist. But if you go through this exercise consistently, you're going to notice that a cultist feels pretty good and like I said before, fits into a variety of teams. The Plague Doctor tip is a pretty simple one and that is just get her some speed, either through a trinket or through some kind of quirk. If Plague Doctor has about 2 or 4 extra speed depending on quirks and trinkets and all that, she will feel like a much different and better character because she's consistently going first and locking down enemy backlines. This also helps her damage game plan because she wants to go early in the round to stick her damage over time effects to people who have not gone yet in order to get damage that round. The final reason she appreciates being faster is because her heal, Battlefield Medicine, works better if she can go first before your other teammates take bleed or blight damage. The Shieldbreaker tip has some slight spoilers for her personally, not for like the end game or something. So if you want to make sure that you don't hear them, then you're free to skip ahead to the next section with Vestal or pause the video or whatever you're trying to do. Now that these spoilers have been appropriately flagged, in Nightmares with Shieldbreaker, you cannot get reinforcements. That means that if you need to stall on the last enemy, like a Rattlesnake or the big two-headed snake, to heal HP and stress, if you have stuns and stuff like that too, that helps quite a bit, you're able to get your party back under control and even de-afflict Shieldbreaker if you want to take the time to do that. This really helps because the stress is kind of a big deal, especially for people who don't quite understand the pacing of the snake fights. So if you're able to get Shieldbreaker back down to manageable levels, it won't feel like she's such a burden for the rest of the dungeon. Because of this, it's never a bad idea to take some kind of chest healer to the dungeons where Shieldbreaker is prone to get nightmares. Personally, I value Crusader and Jester a bit more than Houndmaster for this specific task. Although Houndmaster gets bonus damage versus beasts, and that's something to consider. For Vestal, one of my favorite concepts comes up again, and that's the concept of action economy and proactive and reactive plays. Vestal is able to control both of these. She has a stun and judgment, for instance, to do something proactive, and then she has healing, which is a reactive type of strategy. So my tip for Vestal is to understand when being proactive is better than being reactive. That means stunning enemies that can do more damage than she can heal, and also zapping enemies with judgment to take them out so they don't do any damage at all for the rest of the fight. It always comes back to this hypothetical scenario of why heal for 10 damage when you can stop 15 by stunning the enemy instead. Alright y'all, that's gonna do it for this one. Thanks for watching. The next videos coming up are probably a stalling guide 
and maybe a region guide. I'm also going to start working on the Plague Doctor guide finally because I just really want to make a character guide. But besides that, you all probably know the deal at this point. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. All that stuff, check out the box below. So thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.